Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to The Walk. Today is Sunday, November 28th, and today we are talking about light, the fact that light chases away the darkness, and that as God um, shines his light upon us, it gives us that direction and that guidance that we need. So let's pray. God, I thank you so much for the fact that you do show us where we need to go, and that when we are building our relationship with you and we spend that time alone with you, uninterrupted, you move and that you start to show us things. You give us confirmation upon confirmation upon confirmation that we are on the path that you have mapped out for us. Lord, help us to keep those God goggles on our face and be aware of everything that you want to show us. We only want to see the things that you would have us see. And Lord, we thank you that we get to be a part of it. Keep allowing us to be a part of it. Keep sending us these missions because all we want to do is serve and glorify you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, today we're going to be talking about light and the fact that God sends us his light so that he can show us things that we wouldn't normally be able to see, understand, and it also gives us confirmation when he's calling us to do something that um, may be out of our comfort zone. We may be going, eh, I don't know if that came from me or if that came from you and things like that. So today we're starting in Psalm chapter 18, verse 28. And this is what it says. You, Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. So we have this lamp inside of us, and it's um, a desire for the things of God. It's a desire to grow in our relationship with God. It's a desire to serve God. And it's because of God that that darkness is turning into light and that we have those desires. And then he's saying, keep that lamp burning, keep that fire ignited so that I keep striving to be closer and closer to you. Verse 29, with your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. He's saying, I can't do it on my own. I can do it with the Lord's help. I can do it with the Lord on my side. Verse 30, as for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. So we know that when he is showing us that path, that path is perfect that his word is flawless, and when he's told us to do something, we should have um, confidence and boldness in following through with that. And that as we're doing that, and those attacks come from the enemy, he shields us because we've taken our refuge in him. We know that our safe place is in our relationship with Christ. Verse 30, for who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? That rock is immovable. It's unshakable. It cannot be broken down. Verse 32, it is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He causes me to stand on the heights. All of this is happening through the power of God. Verse 33, um, I'm sorry, I already read that. Verse 34, he trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You make your saving help my shield and your right hand sustains me. Your help has made me great. You provide a broad path for my feet so that my ankles do not give way. He's saying all of that strength and all of the ability that we need in order to serve Christ comes from that relationship with Christ. And without that, with that disconnect and without that happening and being put in place, we cannot be equipped the way we need to be equipped. You cannot do it on your own. You let all that power, all that strength, that ordination of being called to that specific role comes from him. The next passage we're going to is Isaiah 42, starting in verse 12, and it says, let them give glory to the Lord and proclaim his praise in the islands. So the very first thing in this passage that I want to point out is that they are praising God for who he is and what he has done. Verse 13, the Lord will march out like a champion, like a warrior. He will stir up his zeal. 
With a shout, he will raise the battle cry and will triumph over his enemies. So not only are they, is he, are they praising God for who he is and what he has done, but now they're also praising him for what he is going to do because of their faith. They're exercising that faith muscle and they know that God's promises come true. When God says he's going to do something, he is going to do something. Verse 14, for a long time, I have kept silent. I have been quiet and held myself back. But now, like a woman in childbirth, I cry out, I gasp, and I and pant. That particular verse really jumped out at me. You know, um, I think a lot of times when we enter into this relationship with Christ, we go to church, we get active in the church, we're doing the things that um, the, we're fulfilling the roles that have been given us within that church, and we're kind of just growing through the motion. You're kind of quiet. You're kind of holding yourself back. You think, no, God's not calling me for something that significant. There's no way he's calling me. He's going to call some other person. And then you start to realize, yes, that call really is for you. And as you step out in that faith, you're gasping and you're panting and you're crying out because you're afraid. You're like, Lord, I know I can't pull this off on my own. And as you do it, he starts to make everything just fall right in line. His light shows you one step after another step after another step. Verse 15, I lay waste the mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn rivers into islands and dry up the pools. How is that happening? That's happening through the power of God. I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. So now this doesn't necessarily have to be physical blindness where your eyes don't see. This could also be spiritual blindness. And God will lead you in those ways that you do not understand yet and that are not familiar to you. And he will bring you along these paths and guide you along these paths that you've never been down before. Continuing on, I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. So he is going to show you every single step along that path. And the parts that are going to be really rough, he smooths them out for you. It may feel like you're really in a rough spot right now, but imagine how rough it would be if the Lord hadn't already smoothed it out. It always could be worse. So be thankful that you're going through what you're going through because it's building your faith and the Lord is in it and he is taking you through it. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. The Lord is not going to turn his back on you. He's going to be there with you for every step. He's going to show you that path. He's going to light up that, um, he's going to light up that light inside of you. He's going to light up that path and their darkness cannot be where that light is. Verse 17, but those who trust in idols, who say to images, you are our gods, will be turned back in utter shame. We need to keep focused on the one true God. Don't let those other idols come into play. And I know when we're reading the Bible and we read about idols, you're like, oh yeah, I don't have any of these stones that I worship or anything like that. But nowadays, the typical American has other idols. It could be your job. It could be your children's success. It could be sports. It could be anything that pulls you away from God. And we need to keep that in check and be like, no, Lord, I'm not going to allow that to happen. I'm not going to allow that to pull me away from you. I'm going to stay in your light. I'm going to stay in that path. And even though what I see is before me scares me and I don't feel like I'm able to pull it off, I'm going to keep going forward because I know that I can trust you to take care of it. Now we're moving into the New Testament. And we're going to be in John chapter 1, verse 1. And we talked about this just a few days ago, but I wanted to bring it back up and really point out the fact that that light is there. So in John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Remember, Jesus is the Word became, that became flesh. He was there at the beginning. He was with God. And he is also God. 
He was with God in the beginning, verse 3. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. When the, when the Lord said, let there be light, that happened through Jesus. Jesus was the catalyst that caused that light to happen. And when Jesus is in your life, that light is coming from him. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. It takes the light of Jesus to show you everything that you are capable of, everything that you can accomplish through that power of God. It goes way beyond your human cap um, capabilities, way beyond the talent that you were born with. And goes, it takes you to that supernatural level of equipping you. Verse 5. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. You're going to see that darkness in your life. You're going to be aware of it. You're going to be aware of the attacks that come from that darkness. But you have to remember that when that light is lit and it's coming from inside you in that relationship with Christ, it shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome that light. Think of it as like... um like a candle or like a light switch. The light switch doesn't go out unless you, unless you turn it off or the light bulb burns out. So either you're intentionally turning it off or you're allowing it to burn out because you're just staying idle and you're not moving forward along that path. You've got to keep moving forward. The next passage I have is John chapter eight, starting in verse 12, and it says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. We're going to stop right here. That very light that shows you the path you're supposed to be on, shows you the things that God is calling you to do that you feel so ill-equipped for. That light comes from Jesus. He is the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life. You have to make that movement. You can't sit idly and stay in that rut and continue to do things the same way you've always done things because that's how you've always done it. You have to move. Following requires moving towards the person that you're following. Think about um, when you were little and you played follow the leader. If you didn't keep going around the room with the person that was leading, you are no longer following. You have to follow that leading. And whoever follows Jesus will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That very life, that eternal life comes from Jesus. And Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Verse 13, the Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. So the Pharisees are very uncomfortable with what Jesus has said. They're understanding all of those Old Testament scriptures that talk about light. And we only covered two of them, but there are many, 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 many more. And so they're saying, whoa, we've, we've, got, to make, we've got to make it seem as though what he's saying is not valid because otherwise the people may follow him and then we're going to lose our status within the society. So verse 14 is Jesus' answer. Jesus answered, Even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I came from and where I am going. Jesus is saying, I'm the only one that was there from where I came from, and I'm the only one that knows where I'm going. So of course I'm testifying about myself. But you have no idea where I come from, or where I am going. They weren't there at creation back in Genesis when the world was created. Jesus is the one that was there. Nobody can testify about that other than Jesus because Jesus is the one that was there. And the same is true about the rapture. You know, he, we're, we, we have all this um, prophecy in the Bible about the rapture, but until that actually happens, we're not gonna know all of what that's like. We can imagine we can try to put a picture in our head of what it will be like, but it's not going to even hold a candle to the actual experience. Jesus is already at that experience and he understands it fully. Verse 15, you judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one, but if you do judge, my decisions are true. 
because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. Jesus is saying, I'm coming from the authority that came from God the Father. Verse 17, in your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the Father who sent me. So he's basically saying, you know all that Old Testament scripture. You've studied it your entire life in preparation for being a Pharisee. And he said, that is pointing straight to me and that I am the Messiah. And they still don't get it. Then they asked him, where is your father? They're not getting that he's talking about God the Father. You do not know me or my father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my father also. So part of being in that light is knowing who Jesus is. And that requires that time in the prayer closet, that uninterrupted, very focused time with Christ. You're, you're studying scripture, you're praying, you're taking that time to listen to the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. And then he shows you that path. Verse 20, he spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Now I wanna point that out as a part of this light. The Pharisees are very offended. They don't like this. They're, they're feeling like their position in society is at risk. Yet they didn't arrest him. Here he is, he's, he's preaching in the temple courts. That's their turf. It's right near where the offerings are put. They're the ones that do the offerings and they're allowing it. Why are they allowing it? Because it, the hour had not yet come. Everything is in within God's control, God's sovereignty. God knows exactly when things need to happen and he will light things up along your path at exactly that right moment. And you can count on that. You take one step and you can't see the second step, but you can see that one step. So you take that one step and then you take the next and the next. And confirmation will come from conversations you have with other people, moments where you meet somebody that you didn't expect to meet. Confirmation will happen as you follow along that path. Next, we're going to Matthew 5.13. And this is where it starts talking about the followers of Jesus Christ. And this is what it says. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under foot. So he's talking about how salt preserves meat. They used to put salt in meat so that it wouldn't go bad. And if that salt no longer has saltiness, there's nothing you can do to it to make it salty again. It is no longer useful. It gets thrown out. And then verse 14, and this is Jesus talking. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. So stop and think that through. Were that, imagine walking through a valley and you look up on top of this hill and you see a house and there's all this light coming out of the house. That's that light of the world. It's, it allows others to see a glimpse of Christ because of the light that's coming from inside us through our relationship with Jesus Christ. They see how we're living our lives. They see the changes that have happened in us. They see how God is laying things out for us. And they go, maybe there's something to this. You are that light. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. So you don't turn on a light and then put room darkening curtains over it so that the light doesn't shine through. The light has a purpose and you are carrying that light with you everywhere you go. And you need to allow that light to shine on the people around you. When they see that and they understand that your relationship with Christ is significant, it's not just this thing that you're passively doing, then they start to pay more attention and they start to see how God is working in your life. And then they start to realize, maybe I need that in my life. 
And then they keep searching and they keep seeking and then they find Christ and then they become light as well. That's what this is all about. Verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven. Let that light shine. Let them see how you are serving Christ. Let them see the changes that have happened as a result of your relationship with Christ and tell them how you've been equipped to do something that you never thought you'd be capable of. Let that light shine. That light is the love of Jesus Christ coming out of you. In Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 8, it says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. We need to let that light shine. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. That light has a purpose. It has a, a benefit and it illuminates the things around us and it illuminates that goodness, that righteousness and truth. Verse 10, and find out what pleases the Lord. How do you find out what pleases the Lord? You get that nose in your Bible. You pray, you take that time to listen to the still small voice of the Holy Spirit and you will learn what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Turn your back on that darkness. The old you is gone. Be that new creation and expose that past that you have. Tell others how that change has happened and you're shining that light. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. If you wouldn't want people to know that you're doing it, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. That's your bar. That's your measure. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. Imagine it as like um, um, a bunch of candles. One candle ignites another candle, which ignites another candle, which ignites another candle. You know, that light spreads as you go through your life and you serve Christ. This is why it is said, wake up, please, sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. That light is not your own merit. It's not your own power. It's not your own equipping. It is coming from your relationship with Christ. And because of that, the power of that light has no limit. I only have so much strength as a human being, but when I do things through Christ, that strength becomes limitless. I can do anything if I'm doing it through Christ and through his leading. Verse 15, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. We need to be very careful that we are shining that light into the lives of the people around us. And we need to be very careful because they are watching us. They are watching to see, is this relationship with Christ really as big a deal as she says it is? And they're watching that. Verse 17, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. How do you understand what the Lord's will is? You spend that time in your prayer closet. You're praying, you're listening to the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, and you've got your nose in that Bible. You are studying what the Bible says. You're not just passively reading it. You're learning it. You're taking notes. You're remembering it. Verse 18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. So we're to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're not to be drunk on that wine. We're to be overflowing with the power of the Holy Spirit speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs in the spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let your praise for who Jesus is in your life overflow and let others see that it's overflowing from you. In 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 5, it says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. We all have sin in our lives, absolutely. But 
We are covered with that righteousness of Jesus Christ. When God looks at us, we have that righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we need to be walking in that confidence and boldness. Don't get hung up on the fact that you messed up. You tell God about it, you repent, you say, I'm gonna change, I'm not gonna do it again, and you keep moving forward. You stay in that light. Verse six, if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Keep in mind, God sees everything. If you, if you are going feeling like you have to hide the fact that you do that, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. Use that as your bar. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. When we are walking in that light, we have fellowship with other believers we have fellowship with Jesus, his son, and it purifies us. It cleans us and removes all of that sin. I may mess up in an hour, but I can repent of it. I can move on and I can keep going forward. I'm never going to be perfect. The only perfect Christian was Jesus, but I can keep moving forward. I can keep growing in my relationship with Christ. And that growth, the bulk of that growth happens when you are in that, relate, in that prayer closet. Verse eight, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. That God knows that you're gonna mess up and he gave us this plan so that we don't have to wallow in that sin and allow it to separate us in our relationship with Christ. Get it past you, talk to God about it, repent of it, say, I'm not gonna do it again, and keep on moving forward. Let that light of Jesus Christ shine into the lives of the people all around you. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the fact that that light doesn't have to come from us. It comes from our relationship with you. And Lord, we ask that as we spend that time with you in our prayer closet, that uninterrupted focused time with you, that you show us the path we need to be on, that you guide us and lead us to the things that you would have us do in order to serve you, and that that light would grow through us. Lord, all we wanna do is glorify you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. As you go into your prayer closet today, look up Bible verses that have the word light in it. I guarantee you there's a lot more. I, I had a lot of trouble picking and choosing which ones to put in this message. And I really had to pray for guidance from the Holy Spirit on which ones to put in. You will understand what this light is all about as you read more about it. Have a wonderful day. God bless and keep walking the walk.